Welcome and thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Many of our programs, at least over the past several weeks, have been concerned about ways that humans can open up and evolve, basically to chase their dreams, fulfill their desires, and maybe just make those big changes that they're looking for as they approach midlife. Well, today we're going to have a little bit of fun, but also seek some other wisdom that's outside of the human experience by going into the animal kingdom. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is someone who has a very unique touch and insight when it comes to animals, and it's helping to help people to resolve past life traumas. She works internationally, running clinics, performing readings, and facilitating courses in animal communication and healing. And she also works extensively with wild species in their natural habitat, which I think would be very interesting to talk about as we approach the show here. She intuits from these wise creatures gaining wisdom for planetary healing. And I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Miss Madeline Walker. Madeline, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's great to be with you. You know, this is one of those talks. Whenever I happen to have a guest like yourself who's on the program that talks about animal communication, always brings such wonderful intrigue because I think as our listeners tune in and they go, well, okay, this is one of them Dr. Doolittle things, how can you really know what an animal is thinking or feeling? But the truth is we're all really connected, just different expressions of that connection. What's been your experience with that? Wow, it's hard to know where to start. I mean, animals have just taught me so much. Uh, They've taught me so much about how to uh, help with my healing work with humans and, and the information that they can give me about their, their human carers has just been so mind blowing and, and really, really powerful and very, very profoundly uh, correct. I mean, the, the, some of the information they've given me about their humans, even from when they were children, and obviously the animal wouldn't have been with them then, but they can talk to me about injuries that they've had, perhaps. Uh, they're very difficult uh, young lives in, in their, with their parents, all sorts of things. And the people are just so astounded by the, you know, the, the depth of knowledge that these animals have about us because they, they somehow seem to really be able to read us like a book and see right into our very souls. And, and the more that they've taught me, the more I've learned from them, the more I'm just completely blown away by the depth of connection that we have with our animals and just how much they want to really help us through not only this lifetime, but uh, the evidence they've given me has shown that we've been together through many lifetimes and will do again. And, and it's just the, the, the concept and the bigger picture. This little dog told me to remember the bigger picture, and the more I learn, I realize that the bigger picture keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger <laughs> and more and more. Oh, oh, it's all inspiring. Sort of just like the study of cells breaks down to the atoms, breaks down to something smaller, and pretty soon you find yourself studying about nothing until something appears. Absolutely. (laughs) You know, I was just thinking, uh, Madeline, uh, this was some years ago when my parents, they loved Shih Tzus, and uh, they ended up getting a third puppy who has since passed. But I remember when this youngster came into their lives, and I looked into its eyes, and it was a thought that occurred to me, and I wondered if you might be able to maybe of lightness on this, but I thought here was a possibility of a human who finally got it right and this is its next spiritual evolution because Mm -hmm. you've seen this lightness, this happiness. I mean, it was like the dog was smiling at you. It didn't want to do any more than to be in someone's lap to be loved. It was playful. And I thought who better than my parents to be having, you know, to be under their care uh, for this dog's lifetime. What are your thoughts on that? Um, do you mean that that um, the that idea that a inca- human reincarnated oh, got yeah, the human uh, part right and and became this this dog? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, there's been a, a huge uh, arrogance, I suppose, within the hu- humankind that we are the superior species, and that uh, you know, if, with reincarnation, that um, you know, hopefully, uh, animals can attain or aspire to come as a human. <laughs> but uh, actually, I don't believe that. Like it's the all. idea of the amphibian crawling on the land or the ape out of the tree sort of a thing, you know? <laughs> exactly. And they're really, really lucky and really, really good. They may just make it to be a human. Well, I'm afraid I believe that animals uh, know a lot more about um, 
how to treat Mother Earth and, and to be connected to the rhythms of the Earth. And I think, especially with dogs, what better way to, to give and receive unconditional love? I mean, I, I've, I've had several cases where humans have chosen to come as a dog to just to give uh, that love and to really learn about unconditional love because dogs don't care what you look like, you know, in the morning. You can, you can, you know, turn up looking, looking, you know, a complete mess and they just don't care. They just want to love you, you know, and despite mm -hmm. what you do to them, they just want to love you. They certainly and, uh, teach the idea of unconditional love that we keep espousing through all of our spiritual teachings, but we still don't seem to get. <laughs> I think humans, you know, struggle with that concept. Obviously, there are some that, that manage it, but I think many of us, you know, it's something that we, we aspire to, but it, it isn't always easy. Uh, Self-love, I think, is a, is a very challenging concept to work on. But the animals, especially dogs, just they get it. They really do get it. And they're so in the now, in the present, um, and they're just so truthful. You know, they, you can't pretend anything to an animal. You can't lie to an animal. They, they just know, and um, I believe that we choose whatever physical uh, vehicle best suits our soul journey our, for our next phase of our soul journey. So uh, if we want to come back as a horse or if a horse wants to come back as a human, you know, it's just what, what is the, the right uh, next step for that evolution uh, on our soul journey, and uh, I've been shown that in evidence so many times. I'm, I totally believe that now. You know, Madeline, it's interesting that you say that we can't lie to animals because they always know the truth. And what had come to me is uh, not too long ago, I watched a, a wonderful program called uh, "The Spirit or the Story of Equius," which was, of course, about horses. Mm -hmm. And here is an animal that, in my opinion, with the history of its, I guess, living alongside humans, has been to me one of the most understood and at times most abused you know, and, and so forth, animals that there is. And there was a point within this where this uh, gentleman, and I've heard about this before, does what's known as equian therapy. And so what he had was the reporter go into the corral where this horse was and just simply ask the question, whatever the question was on his mind, and then the horse would be able to answer this question. And as the scenario played out, he realized, oh, my goodness, you know, there's a lot of reality into what's going on here because the horse didn't want anything to do with him at first, you know. And he realized that everything he tried to do with this horse to get this horse's attention just wasn't working. And then this reporter, you know, who was pretty spot in his beliefs, actually began to, to cry because he realized what was happening was you're trying too hard to please other people, and you're not taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. The horse was simply communicating, when you begin to be authentically who you are, then you'll have my attention. As that shift happened, sure enough, the horse came over and accepted grain out of his hand. And he says it just blew his mind that he didn't believe that this kind of communication, you know, that this was, he thought, was a lot of nonsense, but... He's now a believer. <laughs> Talk about what your experience has been with people who seem to have that hard tack, like this is a lot of nonsense you people are coming up with, you know, just reasons to kind of maybe, I don't know, bamboozle people, I guess. Well, I suppose, you know, there's, there's I don't know, it maybe is, you know, some high, psychic hocus-pocus sort of thing. Um, I think when you can give them some information that I couldn't possibly know, um, that the animals told me, and you know, and it's so out there that it's not anything I could even imagine or uh, perhaps, you know, um, auto-suggest or anything like that. I think that really makes them sort of sit back and think, whoa, well, that's a bit weird. How on earth did, did they know that, you know? So it's it's always fun because the horses, all, all animals, but mainly horses, love to drop in a real sort of factoid about their, this person's past or whatever they're doing now. Uh, a lovely friend of mine called Julie Dicker, who's sadly in spirit now, but she was a wonderful animal communicator, and she went to see a, a lady's horse, and as the lady went to go and get some money to pay her for the session, her husband just started saying, what a load of rubbish that was, and, you know, and, and uh, <laughs> she was a charlatan and all that sort of thing. And so then the horse said to, to him, said to her to ask him, what about his smoking? He's supposed to have given up smoking. But he's not because he keeps coming out here and having a, um, a you know a, a sneaky cigarette when his his wife thinks he's given up smoking. So she said that to him, and he was, he went white as a sheet, and <laughs> was just like completely shocked. 
And he was just saying, well, how do you know that? And she said, well, your horse has just been telling me you come out in the barn and have a, have a, a cheeky, uh, sneaky cigarette. And he just, well, he just walked off. He was completely, as we say in England, gobsmacked. He <laughs> just couldn't <laughs> believe it, you know. But the horse grafted him up good and proper, you know. It was amazing. So now, I love that story. Yeah, I was going to ask, how, how do you get the communication? Is it on a psychic level where you just kind of in tune and the energy and the flash of an image comes to you? Is that how it works? Well, it's, it's a, like a telepathic uh, connection. Okay. And the thing is, you know, we can all do this. Indigenous peoples have been uh, communicating with the planet, you know, with all the, the all living things and the rocks and the trees and, and the land for eons of time. So we can all do it. We've just forgotten that we, that we could. So it comes in different ways, really, and some of us are very visual and some of us are more kinesthetic. So sometimes I get uh, a picture in my mind, like a video clip. Sometimes I get just a stream of words. Uh, sometimes I get like a, a physical pain if perhaps I'm uh, working with a horse that's got problems with its teeth. I might get a toothache. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it just depends how the animal wants to communicate. And, and no uh, one way is better than another. It just depends in which way the animal wants me to try and interpret what it's hoping to tell me so I can obviously be of help to the animal and also to its its human. Now, it must be intriguing, Madeline, to be someone with your gift. Uh, and as you said, we can all do this. It's just a matter of, I suppose, just putting it into practice, uh, exercising the muscle, if you will. But yeah. the fact that the human body can tune in like that and that we have somehow shut a lot of that down that when someone like you goes out and says, look, we can all do this, really, just give it a shot. It might amaze and blow your mind and actually open up new roadways and ways of living you would have never imagined before, but that we can't trust ourselves to step in that direction because, again, we kind of look around and we get worried about how others think about us. And I'm sure you probably had those times throughout your life, uh, probably not so much you know, in the last several years, but where you were doing this, and people were kind of giving you a hard time about it, and you wondered, should I continue this? Because that's not a hard way or an easy way to live, is it? Well, it, you know, it can be, it can feel a little isolating if old friends, you know, suddenly think you've gone completely crazy overnight. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember I was asked to uh, give a talk uh, or a demonstration of healing on a horse for a, a veterinarian friend of mine, and we had a lot of students from a local college some of which were very open, some were definitely not open. And that was the first time that I'd been shown by a horse that it had been a human before. And when I got that message and I thought, oh, my gosh, how am I going to say that in front of this lot? They're going to just think I'm completely, you know, out of my tree. It's just crazy, you know. <laughs> so I just didn't know what to do, really. And I just thought, well, I've just got to say it, you know, and they'll just take from it what they will. And, and uh, if they think I'm crazy, well, that's just too bad. And and so I did, and it was, I, you know, I just said, look, I wasn't expecting this. This is a completely new concept for me as well, but this horse has just told me that he used to be uh, an, a master of Eastern medicine, and he's come back to help uh, you know, his human in, in expanding their awareness of alternative and complementary medicine. Uh, as, but she was quite a conventional veterinarian at that stage, but she has now become very holistic, uh, interestingly, uh, into homeopathy and all sorts of different kinds of complementary uh, therapies that can aid uh, conventional veterinarians, veterinary medicine. So um, the horse really did come and help her, but it was just that thought of how was I going to say that in front of all these, these students that... Uh, mm -hmm. We're finding it difficult to understand that I could actually, you know, maybe even communicate, even if it was just to ask the horse, you know, what its favorite food was and uh, if it liked its saddle. Um, getting into the realms of reincarnation and not only that, as it, you know, it, it had actually been a human before, that was just way off the chart for, for, for a lot of them. Now, what do a lot of people like to come to you for? Are there a variety of things uh, or questions that they come and ask you regarding their animals? Usually it's behavioral problems. Okay. Um, I work with quite a few rescue animals, so it's quite interesting to be able to find out what the fear triggers are. Uh, having said that, quite a lot of animals are mirroring what's going on with their humans, so very often if an animal has suddenly started to behave in a strange way, uh, maybe seeing very stressed, I always ask the human, okay, so what's going on for you? Uh, and they'll say, well, you know, it's been a bit difficult at work, I've lost, you know, I might have lost my job or having problems with my relationship or my kids. 
And I said, okay, so when did that start? And they'll tell me. And I said, okay, when did your dog start to behave in that way? Or, and I said, oh, well, around about the same time. I went, hmm, well, that's interesting, isn't it? You know, because very often they'll flag up something that needs to be addressed in their human. So I always find that absolutely fascinating. I would, too. Yeah, and, you know, and the fact that you work with also wild species as well as domestic animals, are there differences in their communication between a, a wild animal, for instance, and a domestic animal? I mean, I would think there would be. The wild animals that I've, that I've met um, seem to be more interested in helping humankind um, work with them to help the planet. They're much more into very profound messages of planetary healing, whereas domestic pets seem to be, I suppose perhaps because they interact more with humans, uh, they seem to be more uh, set on helping their human help themselves to, uh, not exactly better themselves, but maybe become healthier and happier emotionally and physically. Whereas the wild animals are really, I think, almost treating us as a, as a whole to create this unification uh, so that we can really start to look after our planet and realize the importance of the animal kingdom because if we don't have an animal kingdom, we don't really have much of a planet and there's not much hope for, for humankind. Well, not to mention the diversity gives us an opportunity to glimpse into the miraculous. You know, when you take a look at, for instance, the symbiosis of relationships that are, you know, of the world, it's quite a fascinating thing, and to realize that you might move in a direction that affects that web in such a way that a species disappears entirely because of a move you made somewhere else, and to realize that, you know, you're basically cutting your own thread as well. Yeah, and everything is connected, and, and Mother Mother Nature is just so perfectly balanced. You know, it's um, it's it's us that, that mess things up. You know, we have very little awareness of just how important you know the sort of the food chains are. You know, say for example, the shark finning that's going on. You know, just millions of sharks being killed for, to make a little bit of you know uh, stock fish stock, and and these creatures are just so perfectly evolved. They are they've been that way for eons and millions of years perfectly formed as they are and yet we are just decimating their numbers and therefore upsetting the whole balance of the oceans and it, you know we're just so short-sighted and um, and just of course it all comes down to to power and money and it's just uh you know it's just tragic it really is i feel heartbroken as you bring that up a uh, documentary that's out there called shark water addresses that particular issue yeah i've seen that um, and it's the, the very fact disgusting. and i don't know if the numbers are true but god forbid if they are that he estimates or it is estimated 90% of the shark population has been decimated and i and i think about that and it just you feel almost disgusted being human to realize that we as a species are doing something like that Absolutely, and I don't know if you've seen the film uh, The Cove. Um, which that, is about... well, that as well, yes. Yeah, We've actually you know, that... had the producer of The Cove on our program. <laughs> right. <sighs> well, I'm, I've met uh, Captain Paul Watson, who, who made Chartwater, and uh, you know, he's still getting into trouble because of him, his fight against the perpetrators. And um, I met him at the International Whaling Commission in uh, Jersey, which is just off an uh, island off the south coast of, of England, and um, it was just a huge honor to meet him because with Sea Shepherd, they're just doing such a fantastic job trying to protect the whales and just, just the most wonderful man. Uh, but like you said, when you see films like The Cove, you just realize, you know, just what's being done to these inc incredible creatures. But despite that, they still, you know, when I meet wild dolphins, they still want to, to help uh, heal us and to you know, help us grow as, as uh, beings. And, uh, and again, the whales, I've just got back actually from Mexico. I went out to try and, and find some blue whales and to connect with some gray whales. And we had the most incredible encounters. And they were just so, oh, I just felt so blessed that they actually showed up and allowed us to be near them. It was just, you know, just miraculous, really. Now, did you do a mind meld much as Spock did in the fourth Star Trek movie? <laughs> I don't know much about that, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, there's a that. scene. Are you familiar with that one? It's the fourth one where they actually travel back in time to collect two humpback whales to bring them forward in time to communicate with this alien ship that's basically destroying the Earth, trying to figure out where do these communicators I used to talk with go. Oh, and, right, but I'm not... I, I'm not
aware of that, but it sounds like a really good move to, oh, to bring the humpbacks it's, because humpbacks would know the answers. They, yeah. they would be able to help. It, it's fascinating because most people in the original Star Trek movies said that was their favorite because of just that. But there's a scene where, of course, they go back to the 1980s. They find an aquarium in San Francisco. There are two humpback whales that are in captivity, so that makes their job pretty easy, actually. Mm -hmm. They just beam these things onto the ship, take off, go back to the future, so to speak, throw these things in the ocean, and they tell this alien probe, hey, we're back. Everything's kosher. Go ahead and go back to space. But there's a scene where, as the lady's taking everybody on a tour, and of course you can be under what you can see underwater as you go by the tank that these whales are in. Spock jumps into the water and he's actually doing a mind meld with one of the whales. <laughs> wow, fantastic! <laughs> so when you get a chance, Star Trek for the voyage home. But you know, let's say going back to the sharks, what have has been communicated to you if you've been in communication with sharks? Well. I met some uh, quite large tiger sharks in the Bahamas, and um, again, that they're just they're just trying to uh, sort of give us a warning about raising awareness of, of just what we're doing. You know, I think in some ways it sounds um, awful, but on a soul level, some of these creatures are agreeing to have these very, very challenging, very traumatic and horrendous lifetimes life uh, you know that they actually choose to come and be killed and it's almost like on it's like a sole agreement that they've chosen to do that so that they can educate us so that finally finally someone like paul watson or whatever um can get it and can actually start to tell people this has got to stop this is you know this is stupid this is absolutely destroying our planet um so it's almost like they're agreeing to do that to create this message that hopefully will start. People will start on with this uh, shift of awareness to really wake up and realize what they're doing. It's it's like the dolphins at Taji. You know, it's like on a soul level they've chosen to do that. Uh, and the captive dolphins that I've connected with, which has been heartbreaking, on a soul level. Obviously, on the physical level, it's it's awful for them. But on a soul level, it's like they've made that choice because. Being in captivity, they can connect with so many more people that aren't maybe fortunate enough to go and meet them in the wild. You know, the, mm -hmm. it's like the, you take the kids and the missus and you go to an aquarium sort of thing. Um, on some level, those dolphins are reaching deep into those people and they will be connecting with them and and creating a shift within them. You know, there'll be something that they may not get right away, but there'll be time a time in the future where they'll suddenly think, Maybe it's not so good to have dolphins in captivity. And, and so they, they are able to affect many more humans than perhaps the wild dolphins are. So uh, it's like a sole agreement that they're, they're choosing, but it's a very, very hard role and a very difficult journey that they've chosen. And I just feel you know, very, very humble to, to realize that, that these, these are such huge beings that they, they undertake these roles to, to help us wake up. How about gorillas? Madeline, what has been your take with that one? Oh, uh, well, um, I've got Moving these, from um, the ocean to the misty mountains of Africa. <laughs> yeah, well, that's another my another journey that's on my list. I have my bucket list. The trouble is every time I, I cross something off, I have about four extra things added on to the bottom of it. So <laughs> I don't think well, I'm ever going to get to Well, as I say, if your goal is big and you're able to achieve it in your lifetime, then it's not big enough. <laughs> no, exactly. So... As I say, my list, I mean, um, one of the things on my list was to, to actually see a blue whale. I thought, if I could see a blue whale, I could die happy. Well, I've seen five blue whales uh, very recent, <laughs> last week, so um, that's one thing ticked off the list. But uh, on my list is also to go and meet the gorillas, and I was actually invited by the Gorilla Conservancy to go out and, and uh, see them, but unfortunately they are in the Congo, and of course there's been a, a lot of rebel unrest, and actually two or three of this gentleman's friends have actually been killed so it's obviously not safe for me to go go there, but um, at some stage I would love to, to go out there. But again, um, I've had these new um, oracle cards out called uh, Animal Whisper Animal Whispers Empowerment Cards, and there is actually a shark card and a gorilla card. Um, and the gorilla card is all about gentle strength and about how the gorilla has immense, immense strength but can be so gentle. Um, the way that they interact, the silverbacks interact with their with their young and how they gently get them back on track and, and just um they're just they're just incredible because they're so humanoid when you look into the eyes of a 
of a gorilla. Maybe that's an insult, but <laughs> you know, look into the eyes of a gorilla, and you see their hands. Their hands absolutely fascinate me because, you know, with their thumbs and the way they use their hands and the way that they hold their their babies and caress their babies, it, it's just it's, it really is like looking into yourself. And so I think they're again an incredible mirror. And you know, it's, again, they're just such a special, special species that have to be preserved. And but you know, the poaching's still going on, and it's just hideous. But again. Hopefully they're teaching us and reaching out to us and, and maybe more and more of us are, you know, saying this has got to stop. You know, we have to really look after these creatures because they are just so special. And when King Kong was remade by Peter Jackson, I still cry at the end. <laughs> yes, it's hideous. <laughs> they it, they actually know? got it right. You know, when I was a kid and seen the original, I loved it because I loved dinosaurs, and I was like, well, you know, he killed a dinosaur, so I don't like him too much, you know. But you mm. still kind of felt a little remorse at the end, like, well, this kind of stinks. He gets surrounded. He's on top of this building. He didn't want to be there in the first place, and the, and the broad's been screaming at him through the whole movie for crying out loud. It's enough to drive anybody crazy, you know. But in this one, you know, she comes and crosses to understand. And that's the beauty, especially when you come to the thought of wild species, as you were talking about sharks earlier and even gorillas. That uh, You know, and I love documentaries, especially about animals. And there was one that was on the white uh, Arctic wolf. And this one was fascinating because it takes – them doing to get out to where these things are you know it just does that's all snow it's cold you really got to want to see it you know and it's just out there it's remote and it got to a point where these documentarians there were i think three of them all together slowly approached them you know but the wolves knew they were there it it came to a point of this arctic wolf which is relatively rare to film is that they had finally crossed over a threshold where the wolves allowed them to go into their den with newborn pups. Wow. And to me, you know, you see this constantly, that when you pay that reverence, that respect, to surrender yourself to realize you and I are alike, just expressed differently, that's what happens. It is all about respect. You know, it has to come from a place of love and respect. Mm -hmm. And that's whenever I meet any animal, be it domestic or wild, I always... uh, visualize sending out a cord of love from my heart to the animal's heart and just Mm -hmm. sending out that whole wave of love and respect because if we can do that then the animals are are really open to reciprocating and and teaching us and it is we have to respect these creatures so much they are just so awesome Mm -hmm. and uh, you know to be allowed into where they have their pups is is just such a, a magnificent opportunity and blessing for those people now, Madeline, I know that you've worked with animals over many years, but is there one particular time that something happened that really moved you in such a way that you felt, you know, and I know this must happen to you a lot, but one particular time that might have moved you so much that you just knew you would never be the same again? Well, all the time, really. <laughs> That's why it's, I figured as much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just very recently, as I said, we, we were out in Baja, uh, and we were out in a, in a little tiny boat uh, with the grey whales in uh, this lagoon, and they had they go there to have their, their calves. And we had a couple of days where we didn't have uh, really, really close encounters. We had some really nice encounters, but not really, really interacting. And, and as so often happens in, in many of my uh, encounters, it seems to be to the, the very last, almost the very last minute of when you think, right, we, you know, in five minutes we've really got to go, and that's the last opportunity to interact with these creatures, seems to happen nearly every time that they give us something completely mind-blowing so that it, it, we go away changed and uh, just forever uh, those memories just stay it, it locked in your heart. And this happened this time as well. We were on our very last, sort of really running out of time, and we met this, uh, mother and calf and, and she'd been around us quite a bit and she sort of dove down and then she was back up again and and then they were coming up fairly close and the baby came up and we managed to touch the baby which was really awesome and then all of a sudden the mother just decided to roll on her back and then just glide underneath our tiny boat she could have tipped us up very easily oh. but she just glided underneath our boat about a couple of inches underneath being very very careful and allowed us to, to rub her tummy 
And then she and she was enormous, and we kept thinking, "Oh my gosh, this just goes on and on and on. This body is never ending." Wow. <laughs> and then so she did that, and we had more, more sort of face rubbing and uh, and petting of the calf. And then they both surfaced right up next to us, and then they they blew out their breath. And as they did so, it's like all the water droplets came up from mother and calf because they did it exactly at the same time. It was like rainbows, uh, uh, rainbow sort of uh, prisms in, in the droplets of their breath. And it just blew all over us. So we got really sort of splattered with their breath. And it was just like they were just anointing us with their love. And it was just, we all went, oh, my gosh, we're never going to wash again. <laughs> my sunglasses were completely sort of spattered and it was all in our hair and I mean, nothing, nothing um, unpleasant. It was just, they just sprayed us big time and it was just, we all were completely blown away, literally blown away by it and we were just, and then we, that was it, our time was up, we had to go and we just thought, whoa, how blessed are we, you know, it's just, mm -hmm. and that's something I shall never forget and looking into the eye of the calf as it looked at, back at you, right into your soul. It's something that just gets locked deep within you, and you can never forget that. It's just um, so beautiful. Perhaps the message was, this is how happy you can be when you don't have to pay taxes, ever. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, that's probably some of it, yeah. <laughs> well, Madeline, now, because a lot of us may have pets, uh, you know, whether it's a dog, a cat, a bird, who knows, uh, what would you say to our listeners uh, to have them start on the path to be able to understand perhaps what their pet is communicating to them? And get the key word here is communication, not necessarily saying, but communicating, because they do it in different ways, I would think. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's about just believing that you can. I mean, I think if anybody really loves their pets, they know that they communicate with each other, you know, um, especially, well, all animals, but dogs are just so clever. Um, I was talking to a lady actually the other day about how her dog seems to know when it's, she's going to take it for a walk without even reaching for a leash or a coat or boots. It's just like the dog just seems to know. And I was saying, well, my dog, I realized that I would um, have a list of chores in my head that I would uh, say, well, I'm going to put the washing out. I better just wash those dishes. I'll just do this and I'll just do that. And then I'll go for a walk. And I realized that on about halfway through my last chore that I'd sort of given myself, my dog would start to go crazy. And I thought, how does she know that? How does she know? I haven't, you know, haven't got, as I said, hadn't got a leash, hadn't got a coat. How does she know that? And I realized that she was reading my mind because I, tried, I experimented. And every time I, I sort of had these lists in my head, she would know and she would wait till I was getting to the last, about the last few minutes of my last chore. And then she'd do it every time. So then I thought, Right, I'm going to ask you, where do you want to go? Which is your favorite walk? So I would show her telepathically in my mind a choice of three or four walks. And I'd ask her to show me where she wanted to go that day. And I would get a picture back in my mind or I'd get a word. And I'd say, okay, we'll go there then. And it was amazing because she'd jump in the car and we'd arrive at the destination, her chosen destination. And she would just be going crazy, going, yeah, thank you. We're at my best place today, you know. And um, so I think it's about, just sitting quietly with your animal and just, as I said, extend that cord of love from your heart to their heart and just maybe ask them a question um, and just see what you get back. You may not get an instant reply, but you may get one perhaps when you're not trying too hard. Perhaps you might have gone and, I don't know, had a shower or something or be doing the dishes, but you'll, you will get an answer or you may get a feeling, as I said, but it's just trusting that because that's, that's the way we start. That's the way we start stretching those Tel telepathic muscles and you'll be surprised just how how easy it is and just mm -hmm. how amazing you know it can be now you do have what are known as animal whispers empowerment cards tell us a little bit about that well these cards as i mentioned earlier that they are of lots and lots of different kinds of animals i wanted to include many different species that hopefully would resonate with with everybody so there are domestic pets in there there's a, a dog card a cat card a, a guinea pig card and there's a mouse but there are also as i said sharks and whales and dolphins and manta rays um there's a buffalo there's a, i want and there's a, a moray eel there's a snake there's uh, the ant card there's a dragonfly so i wanted to try and cover as many different species as possible because I've been given so many amazing messages that I thought, well, what's the point of me getting these messages if I can't share them? You know, if, I, if I can't make use of them to help people, then why, why do the animals bother telling me? I have, to, I have to be committed to pass their wisdom on. 
So I've been wanting to do uh, an Oracle card set for quite a long time. And then my publicist, Fintorn Press, put me in touch with this wonderful illustrator, Richard Crooks, who's done several card sets, and he's absolutely fantastic. He's brilliant. So together we, we, we got together, and I sent him quite a lot of photographs of the actual animal that had given me the message. And then he just um, developed it and expanded it into the most beautiful image of these cards. And I'm just so excited about them because he's done such a beautiful job with them using some very intense colors sometimes. So the colors are actually affecting the readers as well. But it's just so nice to be able to look at the cards and know that many of them are the actual animal that I, that I actually swam with or met um, because I'm lucky enough when I'm swimming with wild uh, sea mammals that there's very often a photographer that can actually photograph and capture that moment of interaction. Mm -hmm. And therefore I have a sort of photographic evidence of that encounter and then I can say, well, this is the, this is the uh, whale shark I met, and this is what the whale shark said to me. And to have that in a card uh, that holds the energy of the animal is just wonderful. So, uh, you know, it's just been fantastic to create these cards that have the messages, uh, so they're not, nothing's wasted of anything that's been given to me. I, I've managed to, to share them, uh, and hopefully that they'll, well, I know they've been helping a lot of people uh, already, and it's just lovely to, to share them with people. Now, Madeline, do you actually work with people uh, by phone as well if they decide, hey, you know, I'd kind of like to figure out what's going on with my pet here or what they're trying to say? Is that something you're able to do? Yes. I, I mean, obviously I've got, uh, I'm have got. i based in the U.K., but I, and I travel a lot, as we've said, but I, I do work with uh, phone and Skype. Skype's been fantastic because I, uh, I had actually a, um, a lady from San Diego today. I had a Skype session with her working with some dolphin healing en energies, and that was wonderful. But I do uh, readings. People can send me a photograph, uh, maybe a little bit of fur, and then I can um, do a reading and email it to them, and then we can have a follow-on uh, phone or Skype chat about what's come up, and perhaps if there's been a past life trauma, we can work through that uh, or just discuss my findings and what the animals had to say. So that's really great because I can reach people anywhere in the world um, and hopefully help them and their animals. Now, what is your website, Madeline? My website is uh, anexchangeoflove.com, and uh, on there are all the sort of information about uh, my books and CDs and uh, the cards, and also the services that I offer for people and their animals. And I work with people in, you know, as on their own as well, so I, I can do a combined animal and human, or just an animal or just a human. So, but uh, but generally, when I'm working with with a human, the animals tend to come in and direct the whole session anyway. So uh, <laughs> it's always fantastic. <laughs> Those guys are a mess, trust me. Just sit here and listen to me as I wag my tail, and I'll tell you what really is going on here. Because exactly, what they that. really need to hear. <laughs> well, Madeline, thank you so much for being on our program. It's nice to know there's a Dr. Doolittle in all of us. Absolutely, absolutely. It's been great to speak to you. Thank you so much. And again, that website? It's an exchange of love dot com. Madeline, thank you again. Thank we you so thank, much. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. We'll have a hot link up there for you as well on our website at beyond fifty radio dot com. That is the number fifty. We also do have a free weekly updated newsletter for you to sign up for as well. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond Fifty Radio program, and remember, live your day past.